Perfect. Okay. So on today's lecture, I want to go into the doc document object model. So last lecture, we kind of went over some of the standard uh, objects that are built into JavaScript, like math and um, uh, some some of the others like date. So today, I I, I really want to start getting to the meat of browser of, of of using JavaScript as a very domain specific language and how we can use it to uh, affect the contents of the browser. So so let's see here. So uh, there's gonna be a quick kind of overview of what we're going to do over the course of this uh, lecture. We're going to look at the browser environment in particular and some of the, uh, the specs in the browser. Then we'll talk about the DOM tree, the document object model tree, and then uh, ways that we can browse the DOM or walk the DOM. Then we'll follow that up by searching mechanisms where we can search for very specific items from our DOM and access them from our JavaScript. That'll be Part four here, we'll look at then what are properties of uh, the HTML elements or the node properties that we can access from the DOM. Uh, we'll probably skip past attributes and properties and jump right to being able to then modify the DOM from JavaScript. And then we'll look at very briefly some things that relate to being able to set styles or element sizes and scrolling or window sizes or even get the coordinates of the mouse all from javascript and the document object model okay so with that said let's talk about the dom in terms of the uh the browser environment so i, I mentioned this earlier and this is a good place to really highlight this javascript was initially designed as a domain specific language when it was initially created, it was made exclusively for uh, mutating the state of uh, the content in a web browser. So we're actually learning how to use JavaScript very much the way it was originally intended to be. However, JavaScript has evolved uh, into a general purpose language with many different use cases all across many different platforms. And so the JavaScript platforms that we'll be looking at exclusively for this class are really going to be in the confines of browsers and web servers. But uh, anything that has a JavaScript uh, uh, interpreter has a host environment, you can, you can build JavaScript applications for. And so each JavaScript platform, and a different word that you'll see in the, um, inside of the uh, documentation for platforms, also what's called a host environment has its own specific functionality. And in other words, what we're, what we're saying here is that it has its own set of objects and functions, which is in addition to the language core itself. So when I mentioned the DOM or there's also the, the, broad, the browser object model, this is, these are special libraries and objects that are injected into our JavaScript runtime environment because we're running it inside the browser and allows us to do really cool and powerful things inside the browser. So anything that we look in the document object model is really just for browser development. It won't carry over into, uh, into Node or if we're running our JavaScript runtime environment right, on, right, right inside of a terminal or right on top of our OS. In which case, th that will be its own platform with its own set of libraries and objects that we'll have access to. And so we'll talk about some of those more specific node level uh, the, for, the, for the node runtime environment, what objects and libraries we'll have available to us and how it distinguishes from the, the DOM and what we have available in the browser level. Okay. So the first thing we need to know is, let's take a quick bird's eye view of what we have as JavaScript runs in the web browser. So, I mentioned this before, the first thing that we have, the root object that we're initially uh, given access to from the uh, dev tools and, and from our scripts as well, any JavaScript that we run, would be this window object. And so the window object inside of it has everything else. So the window object defines what JavaScript objects are, 
it's going to define what arrays are, it's going to define what functions are. So everything part of the JavaScript spec is defined within inside this window op um, object. Our DOM, which will have some global variable that's called document. So our, our references to our DOM API will be given to us by this window object. And then all the other kind of APIs that's made to available to us by the browser itself, like uh, navigator or screen or location or frames or history, will also be contained within inside this window object. So what we're gonna really be looking at from the window object is going to be this global document object here, which will allow us to go ahead and uh, mutate the state or access any of the HTML elements in our HTML document from our JavaScript. Okay. Okay, so the big thing here is there's two different roles that Windows serves at. It's a global object for JavaScript code and it also represents the browser window. And so we'll use it uh, as we continually develop code at the client side for those two uh, reasons. So in the instance of a global object, if we declare functions or variables without defining them in the scope of some class, then they exist in the global scope and the global scope is that window object. And so I believe I showed that earlier how when I declared a function or variable at global scope, I can inspect the window object using the keyword this and see that those functions and those variables did exist inside the window object. Um, similar, the window object maintains a lot of properties related to the state of the browser. So you can query the window object for like the height or the width or a number of other um, features or attributes you might need to know in order to render your content appropriately. Okay, so let's talk about the DOM or the document object model. The document object model or DOM for short represents all the page content as objects that can be modified. So essentially the big thing about what the DOM allows us to do is it parses HTML elements and converts them into JavaScript objects and uh, with properties as opposed to attributes. And again, the document is the entry point into our uh, web page. That's going to be the reference we use to access the API. So, and I don't know if I showed this the other day, but I'll show it right now. If I go to about that blank, if I hop right into my console here, and if I just type in a uh, document, I can see, yep, there, there's my document. And I can unpack it. And yep, that's the representation of what the document looks like. And I can actually prove that that's inside the window if I just type in window, which is also the reference to this. Um, I can actually inspect and see that there should be, oh, let me just, let me do a refresh and let me just prove by doing it. There we go. You see that the document is actually located in window. But since window is at the global scope, anytime I go ahead and type in a variable name, it will dereference it from the window object by default. So I don't have to explicitly prepend the window scope on anything that's in global scope. The browser will automatically try to dereference from, 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 uh, from that scope. When I just type in either a function name or a uh, variable name. Okay. Okay, and so an example of how we might use the document object is we can access its properties. One of the properties is the body property. There's also a head property. So this gives us access to like the uppermost um, root elements. And so we can access properties of those elements such as style. We can access the actual specific values of those styles just as we would on any other objects. We can use dot notation to dive down. So from the document object, we access the body element. From the body element, it has a style uh, attribute. And the style attribute is a background property. And on that background property or key, we can 
go ahead and set it to red. So programmatically in our JavaScript, we can update the style of one of our HTML elements. And that's just as a, a simple use case. Okay, there's also the browser object model, which represents additional objects provided by the browser that's not part of the HTML document. We will talk about that later on a kind of need to know basis on, uh, on things that are good to know about. We won't do a deep, deep dive into the browser object model like we build the DOM, only because it's, it's very good to know exactly everything that's going on with the DOM, especially as we lean into learning more about React, as one of the biggest features React will provide to us is this understanding that it maintains a virtual DOM. So having a strong understanding of what's happening with the real DOM, the DOM that's maintained by the browser, will help increase what's going on with React and how it's able to get some of the performance gains it has. Okay. So I think that's pretty much all I want to say about the actual browser environment. Uh, so we talked about the standards and how um, the DOM specification essentially describes the document structure, the manipulations, and the events that are uh, that occur with inside the HTML document. There's also a, a, another object model for CSS, right? That that uh, that discusses how we import things into our browsers in in the form of style sheets. And in terms of the HTML specification, a HTML specification actually includes this concept of the browser object model. So it's not just the markup language and the tags itself, but anytime HTML has updates, there's actual implicit uh, understandings that uh, HTML itself affects uh, libraries or, or, or modules that can interface with the HTML. And so in a, a big example of that is with HTML5, they released the canvas element. Now you've been playing around with the canvas element in the most recent lab. The canvas element is powerful because it's an embedded attribute, it's an embedded API right in the browser. It's not just a tag to represent a content type, it's a tag that represents a content type built into the browser that along with that tag has a unique API that provides all sorts of programmatical uh, interfaces and uh, behavior. And so moving forward, this is how the HTML spe uh, uh, sp specs are actually kind of evolving. The, the understanding that browse the, essentially the browser vendors gets to dictate what API calls are going to be standardized in the browsers and accessible inside the JavaScript runtime environment. And again, that's the parallel that's different than the actual document object model. When we talk about document object model, we're really just talking about the, the model of the HTML document itself. So everything else on top of that would be part of the browser object model. Okay, so the backbone of any HTML document are the tags. According to the DOM, every HTML tag is an object and nested tags are children of the enclosing ones. So the text inside a tag is an object as well. Everything is, everything is an object in the DOM. Uh, so all these objects are accessible using JavaScript and we can use them to modify the page. So for an example, we have document body, like I showed earlier, and that would essentially represent the body tag in our HTML. So again, I think this is the same example I showed before. So I'm going to skip by, back there and I want to talk more about um, uh, how we can kind of visualize this tree. So imagine if we had this HTML here. So we have the outermost tag, the root would be the HTML tag. So that would be here. The children of HTML would be head and body, right? So we could represent head and body here. Uh, a child of head would be the title. A child of body, well, we didn't explicitly put any, uh, any body value in there, but that's on purpose to illustrate that uh, in addition to these element nodes inside this tree, so now I'm going to start calling all these things nodes, we not only have element nodes, but we have text nodes. And the text nodes can take an, a number of different formats because it actually builds the HTML document. So an HTML document is a combination of text nodes, of element nodes, and even comment nodes. 
So inside this example, I have the element nodes, which are in blue, and the text nodes, which are in yellow, which represent either new line characters or it represents uh, text here that's contained inside the title, new line character, new line character inside the body. I have uh, text, but it's not, it's not in case, it's not encapsulated in between a uh, element tags. Okay, so here's a, another example. I mentioned that we have comments. Comments are not the same as a text node and it's not the same as a element node because they don't render. So even though this isn't something that displays in the viewport, technically it's still part of our HTML document and therefore it's still gonna get modeled as part of the document object model. And again, this is just a visualization of what this looks like here. Okay, so if everything in HTML, even comments, is part of the DOM, then um, then there's there's four re, uh, big, big, big uh, objects. If everything is an object of type node, essentially, then there's four objects, node objects, that we should be aware of. The document object, which is our actual entry point into our DOM, the element nodes, which will represent the actual HTML tags inside of like our DOM tree, the text nodes, which can contain text embedded into the HTML document and the comments nodes as well, which can sometimes be useful, but not so much. Really the two most useful ones that you'll use uh, almost always is gonna be your document object and your element uh, node objects. And then every so often you might use the text uh, node objects. Honestly, you could normally get your text, you can extract your text using the element node objects. Uh, comments, you don't use all that much, honestly. Okay, so enough about the, uh, about traversing the tree. Let's talk about, ag oh, or let, enough about describing the tree structure or modeling the DOM as a tree. Let's talk about how we can walk or browse the tree to start accessing data from our DOM. So here I included a picture that illustrates how we might traverse our DOM nodes. So the DOM allows us to do anything with elements and their contents, but to do anything with them, we have to be able to reach whatever corresponding DOM object we might need. So all of our operations on the DOM starts with the document object. And so again, that's the main entry point. And so here in my example, we have the document object. From the document object, I can access a property that's called document element. That is the root element of HTML. Another built-in property I'll always have access to is document.body. That allows me to, to access the contents of just the body tag. I also have document.head. That would allow me to access the contents of just the head tag. And then inside there, there will be collection of nodes um, and inside those collection nodes could be element nodes. Uh, and so I could grab those and access data or set up event listeners or change or mutate or add nodes uh, in, in, inside of my DOM. Okay, so here we have the document element, the document body, the document head, and again, just to illustrate what this looks like, so it's not just on the slide, we can hop right into our interpreter and try that out. So here, if I do document, dot, and you can see one nice thing about the interpreters is that anytime you want to inspect what methods or behaviors you have, it starts to autocomplete for you. So you can always do um, a dot and then see all your different options. So if I want to check the the uh, which this isn't the slide I was on. If I want to check the topmost element, I could check either document element, body, or head. So document element gives me everything in the HTML. Document head gives me the head and the body. So whenever I 
need access to these particular elements. It's very easy to just dereference them without having to walk the DOM or search for them. So these are always, always readily available. Okay. So let's talk more about how we can navigate the DOM based off of this concept of node objects. So they have children, child nodes. Okay, let's see. There we go. Children, child nodes, first child, or like that. Okay. So there are two different terms that we can use from now on. The child nodes or children are the elements that are direct children of a particular node. And so then you also have descendants. These are all the elements that are nested in the, in the given one, including children, their children, and so on. So for instance, in this example, our body tag has a child to div and uh, unordered list. Its descendants, the descendants of body would include its children, like the div. It would include that unordered list, but it would also include the list item uh, since the list item is a child of an ordered list, and an ordered list is a child of body, uh, and also it would include, uh, yeah, that, that seems, uh, I see the list item, I think that's, that's everything I see there. Okay, and so a quick example of how this might look, now, let me see, this is kind of looking small on my screen, I might have to blow this up some. To nope. Let's see. Let's see if I can't. Okay. So let's take a look at this right here. So suppose that I'm I go ahead and from my uh, HTML. So I have my HTML here. I'm going to define a body tag. Inside my body tag, I will define a div that will have the text begin. I'll have this unordered list that just has some information. Then I'll have this div that has an end. Then I'll embed there's just this inline script just to, to, to illustrate what we can do with the DOM. And I'll do this for loop. I'll use the enhanced for loop. So for each node from document.body. And so one of the attributes of body is child nodes. So I'm gonna console.log each node that comes back from child nodes. And so what's gonna display on my console here would be my, you'll see that I have a, um, a uh, div, a div, a, a unordered list, a div, and then my script. So we can see that we can very easily get the entire collection of children nodes for any particular element by just going ahead and using uh, child.nodes as a um, as a property and so the type of that so if i just do document.body.child nodes i can see that that data type is a node list so node list properties also have a first child and last child to give fast access to your children or you can just walk across it as so okay so node list and html collections look just like arrays and I don't think I had mentioned HTML uh, uh, collections yet, but I'm gonna show that in a future slide. Uh, but it's important to know that neither of these, the node list or the HTML collections are actually a collection, uh, is an, an array, they're actually collection objects. So they're very array-like, they're iterable like arrays, so we can use things like the for of loop, we could use for loops on it. Uh, however, we can't use the array methods. So any of the cool things like the ability to filter or map or for each will not work on HTML collection nodes. It will wor not work on node list. This is an important thing to kind of understand only because you'll probably be tempted to use these on HTML collections and node list. Not to say you can't do this. This is one of the fantastic things about the destructuring um, uh, operator you have via the spread operator. So you can always destructure and iterable like a array, um, a, a node list or HTML collection and convert it into a, a actual array. And then you could apply your, uh, your array methods on it. You could also use the array.from method, but I always find that the spread operator is kind of easier to use. 
Okay, and so the DOM collections that we can get returned from methods are typically going to be read-only. Things like child nodes are really just used for reading and not for writing. You would want to access them. You want to access the actual element. You want dereference it from the collection in order to do any kind of mutations on it. Okay, so let's talk about not just children, but the siblings and the parents. So siblings are those nodes that are the children of the same parent. So for instance, inside my HTML node here, it would have siblings of head, or the head and body would be siblings to each other. They're both children to HTML. And they both probably have their own sets of children inside of our document object model. And so you know, if we want to access siblings, we have properties inside of our objects called next sibling and previous sibling. So now we know that we have first child and last child that gives us access to the first and last child, or we can just look at the children nodes and get a node list of all the children of a, of a, of a node object, or we can ask a node object for its next sibling or previous sibling. So lots of accessibility in terms of finding things as it relates with inside of our document object model. In addition to that, we can also ask what the parent node is. So if we were to just look at our document object and let's take a look at the body. Uh, let me zoom back out on this now. Let's go back to fit. Okay, so if I was to look at my document object and dereference the body, body is going to be a node. So it's gonna support this parent node. I can then ask is the parent node the document dot document element, which is the HTML element, and that would be true. Yeah, I can then uh, I can query okay on the document head, uh, get its next sibling, and I should be able to see if the next sibling is going to be the body element, the HTML body element, uh, which is this is the concrete um, uh, class that it would represent that our our body would represent. So we're going to look in just a couple slides what the actual JavaScript inheritance hierarchy is of our DOM. Uh, and so we're going to see that it's about four or five layers deep. And it's, it's relatively good to know just what's happening in terms of what abstract classes are used to build each of these concrete classes. But in this instance, the actual concrete class of the body is HTML body element. The concrete class of the head is the HTML head element. And this and really, just like inheritance would in an object-oriented system, it just means we have access to different properties and behaviors based off of the inheritance hierarchy. Okay, so, so far, so far, everything I've mentioned in terms of the ability to look at the siblings, to be able to look at the parents, to be able to look at the children of our document object model by defining all of the objects inside of our document object models as node objects, right? Now we said though that node objects represent everything in our document object model. So they represent text nodes, they represent comment nodes, they represent element nodes. Often it is the case that you only care about one type of node inside of these, uh, inside of these, uh, uh, inside of the DOM, and it's the element node. It's the ones that are actually tagged with markup to be HTML elements. And so for that reason, there's a number of behaviors, there's a number of methods that are exclusively designed to go ahead and give us that uh, element-based navigation. So here we go. So our navigation properties here have been listed above for all nodes. So, so child nodes would give us, as I mentioned before, text node, element node, and comment nodes. But here, if we want to just get the elements, we use a very similar vernacular, very similar syntax. We just uh, append the word element to indicate what we want is element. So we can ask for the parent element. We can ask for the previous element sibling. We can ask for the next element sibling. We can ask for the children, or we can ask for the first element child and the last element child. So really the distinction between what I showed previous is that uh, those methods will return node objects and node objects are a more abstract thing than element uh, node objects. So element objects 
element objects are essentially node objects that are restricted to the HTML element. And so let's just take a look at how we will do the same thing we did previous, but as I illustrated, one was put into a collection called a node list. This would be put into a collection called an HTML collection. So let me go and zoom up on this a little bit so we can see this a little bit better. Okay, so again, it's gonna be the same type of HTML. I have HTML, inside my HTML I have a body. So on my body, I have a div that has some text called begin. I have an unordered list that has one list item that has uh, the text of information. I have one div that has the text of end, and then I'm gonna create a script tag that's going to run through a for loop. And for each node on my document object, I will access the body. On body this time, I'm gonna access children, which is going to return the element. So notice the difference here is that here, I have, uh, and I console log these out, I returned just my HTML elements here. And I, in fact, if I go and query, what is this? I can see it's an HTML collection. And HTML collection implies that it's something that is a smaller subset than node list. It's just things that are actually encoded as HTML elements. And so, our HTML collection does have its own properties. It has a first element child property and that last element child uh, uh, property to give us for, for uh, quick and fast access to our first and last children. So let me let me just quickly look at the difference in output. So here, every time I console logged this out, notice before I was looking at my div begin, my unordered list, my div n, and my script tag, it was actually also printing out the state of my text nodes. And these tech node, uh, text nodes are going to be the new line characters. So everything in between our uh, tags will then get encoded and represented inside of the DOM as a text object, because that's technically what it is. Like, even if it's something you're not visually seeing, there's some text formatting there that's making new lines between the markup. That's not part of the markup itself. It's not part of the elements but it's part of the formatting, just like comments are part of the uh, the meta instructions or meta notes, meta content that's not available to the end user, but available to developers who are looking at the source code. So again, the entire point of the document object model is it will represent the entire HTML content. Uh, and so we can then decide at how, what the granularity of accessibility we need from it is. So again, uh, child nodes delivers a node list, whereas children gives me an HTML collection. For the most part, though, node lists and HTML collections are very similar to one another. Uh, they're both iterable. I can. They're both not technically arrays, but they're array-like. They're a data type collection, which we can destructure into an array if we need to get our powerful array processing behaviors on it. Okay, let me... Go back and zoom back out on this. Fit that. Okay. So, uh, so just some big takeaways for walking the DOM is that uh, they are every ele every element inside of our DOM has some properties like parent node. It has first child and last child, previous sibling and next sibling. So those five right there, un in uh, for all nodes which are can be stored in a node list are the actual individual will return individual values um the the child nodes returns a node list so maybe i should this is where i should put this node list in there okay so for our element nodes which we call html collections and i'll put this here We can access these same things, but notice we just, instead of the word node, we use elements. Instead of child nodes, we use children. Instead of first child and last child, we use first element child, last element child. Instead of previous sibling, next sibling, we use previous element sibling, next element sibling. And then if you need to walk across, you can access the children and then the children of the children or the children of the children of the children. You keep walking however you need to. Now this is, this is for browsing. 
Uh, but typically, you don't want to browse the entire DOM unless it's necessary. Uh, likely, what you want to do is be able to actually search your document object model to find a particular node that you're look or a particular element that you're looking for. So let's talk about searching via element. So all of the searching criteria that we have in the document object model will really be uh, clued in for element uh, node objects, so the element objects. So the, the first and probably one of the most common ones that you'll see, and this, uh, this is the one that we have in the lab, uh, this might actually, uh, I don't know if this was inside the platformer game or not, but it's certainly in the new lab that's about to come out. Uh, it's the ability from the document, again, our entry point document, we can ask the document, document to give to us back an element by its ID. And so this is why IDs are such a huge, huge aspect of, um, of encoding on the browser side. So we learned how we give class attributes in order to apply styles to our HTML content. We use IDs, which should be unique, to be able to access into our JavaScript so that we can do interesting things with them, either use them to read uh, data, to process it, or to mutate the state of our document object model. And so just a, an example of this is suppose that I had this HTML uh, content here. So I have this div class. This div class, I'll give an ID attribute, attribute that I'll just call ELEM, right, short for element. And then inside, why don't I say I even have a nested div class that has its own ID, which will be this like element content. And it'll have the text element inside there. I'll just put this inline script just to illustrate how we can go ahead and uh, do some interesting things here. So I'll create a variable called uh, ELEM. And from there, I'll just go ahead and from the document object, get that element by ID and give it that ID name. And now I could do whatever I want. Now that I have reference to that HT, that, that, that object inside the DOM, since it's a live object, which means that what's happening inside of the browser's viewport is based off of the state of the DOM objects, any mutations I do to that state will affect what's being viewed from the browser. So as I mutate that, as, as I go and access its style attribute and inside the style attribute, define like the background property would be red, it will instantly make the, um, the background go red. And so we, we've seen that again with the platformer game, as we mutate the state of our canvas object, our canvas object in real time is constantly updating and changing the position of the images. It's just we're, we're making all those calls instead of through the DOM, through the Canvas API. But effectively, conceptually, they're kind of very similar. Just one allows us to manipulate the actual uh, HTML elements. The other one, it gives us like the drawing uh, uh, Canvas area that we can programmatically insert graphics into. Okay. So what are other ways that we can go ahead and search? Well, I already mentioned that the ID is unique and I think I've already impressed upon that earlier. Always make sure your ID attributes are, are unique inside of your HTML, super important. Otherwise you won't be able to access the elements you want. Uh, okay, so some other methods that we can, we can go ahead and use to be able to search our, our document object model. We have a query selector all so the query selector all could be called either from the document object model. I think I did that here, yeah. So I could either call that from the document object or I can actually call it off of an element object itself. So I'm highlighting that this can be called off of an element object, but I also have reference to it from the document. So essentially the, the query selector all, I pass in a parameter which will be a CSS selector and it could be any CSS selector. So it, it could use a, um, it could use a uh, identifier, it can use a class name, it could use a pseudo class, it could use, uh, if you go back and look at the various selector types that you have, any one of those would be valid. And so what it's gonna return back are all elements inside whatever element we did this query on that matches that given CSS selector. So this has been a very, very powerful tool alongside by uh, being able to get an element by ID to be able to search your HTML documents for a collection of elements. And so here, I'm going to zoom up on this really quick so we can look at uh, a sample case here. 
So suppose that I have this HTML document here, right? So I have my body tags. I only include the body tags here uh, for this case. Uh, okay, I have an unordered list that has two list items. The first is the, and the second is test. I have another unordered list that has two list items. One is has, the other is passed. And then I have this script that's embedded here. Let's see, right here, I will then on the script, create a variable called elements. And I'm gonna assign to my elements, a call for my document object. On my document object, I'm going to do a query selector all method. And I'm gonna pass it this uh, class, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the CSS selector. So essentially what I'm gonna do is on unordered lists, I'm going to find the list item that is the last child and grab that collection. So it'll iterate over all of that where this is the selector, where this is the case. Then I'll just quickly go ahead and iterate just to see what I grab here. Uh, on each element inside of my elements uh, collection. So that should be an HTML collection because it's iterating on elements, uh, element nodes. So I'll have an HTML collection here. So for each element in my elements HTML collection, I will just go ahead and I will display the what the inner HTML of that is so that I can kind of see what is the text, what is the content that is inside those elements. So if I'm looking for the last child of, um, of the unordered list of the, the list items, then I have two unordered lists. So I would should expect to be able to get test and passed to be those elements that I get in this HTML collection on, uh, on, on this uh, variable here on line 12. And if I look at my console, I can indeed see that I display out test and pass. So I was able to essentially scan and search this entire DOM and return these two particular elements. And in fact, any selector that you can go ahead and define, you can be able to grab those elements. So super, super powerful uh, mechanism. Uh, so if you don't, so if there's more than, so really the takeaway here is if there's more than one element and there's a very specified way that you can narrow down and filter what those elements are, uh, you can pass that in using these uh, class selectors. And then in addition to having the query selector all, there's also a query selector method. The query selector method is just like the query selector all method, only it returns the first instance of what it finds. Oh, where, where'd it go? Although I gotta zoom back out. Very good, fit that. So essentially uh, query selector would be the same as doing query selector all and just indexing it to the zeroth uh, element, uh, to the first element or the element held at index zero. It's just having this method looks a little bit cleaner than dereferencing from a collection at index zero for the one element you're looking for. So that's just a shorthand way, uh, version of getting the first element that appears. And especially if it's, you know, it's gonna be the only element that appears. Okay. Okay, so some other ways we can go ahead and search our DOM for some very specific uh, data. We have a matches method. So in the matches method, we have uh, we can call this on an actual element object. So again, we are we don't necessarily have to call it on the document object. And here, when it's called on the element object, we pass it in a, a CSS uh, selector as well. And so here, what it's going to do is it's going to return a Boolean value on whether uh, it has a match or not. So this just comes in handy if you wanna check something before you try to start mutating, to so check to see if something exists. So just again, a quick example of what this actually looks like in practice, because I think that's always one of the best ways to know how this actually works is suppose that you have your HTML document. So I have my body tags inside here. And then I'll have two anchor tags. So I have an anchor tag that has a uh, href that goes to this uh, zip file here. And then I'll have another href that goes to uh, this Russian site. Okay, so in my script tag, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna create a for loop and I'll use this enhanced 
for loop on uh, incrementing across all the, ch the children of the body. So just as a quick test, if I call children, will that give me a node list or will that give me an HTML collection? Well, we can always see here. If you, if you ever wanted to check, oh, no, not quite like that. You can always do document dot body dot um, children, and that should be the HTML collection. as opposed to child nodes, which is very evidently the node list. Okay. Anyway, so we're gonna, we're gonna iterate over from our document object, we will access the body tag. So the body tag is this, and then we'll iterate over all the children, which will just include the element nodes. So it would be this anchor tag. It will be this anchor tag, and it would be the script tag because it's technically a, uh, an element a child element object of the body, but it will it would ignore the new line character that follows the body tag and the new line character that follows the uh, this anchor tag and this anchor tag. Okay, so we'll iterate over each of the element objects, and from these element objects, we will invoke on it this matches method to see if the element that I'm iterating across matches, and then I can give it the selector. So this is the selector of a um, of uh, uh, in CSS where it's going to look at anything that is an anchor tag. So it automatically will uh, not select the script. But then there's additional criteria that is um, defined with inside the square brackets here. The square brackets will look at an attribute to this particular tag name. So the attribute would be href and it will check to see if the href ha contains zip inside of it. And so out of my two anchor tags, there's only one that has a uh, the term zip inside of its href. And so we, if we console log, we'll see that we're able to go ahead and let's see, I will then console log the archive reference and then actually pass in the element where that matches. And you can see that it actually gives me the, the href where it has that file that so. So again, this is just a very, um, uh, an illustration how we can not only query for specific elements, but we can check for matching. So if we wanted to actually uh, invoke some, some properties on here, we can be guaranteed that those properties exist ahead of time. Okay, let me zoom back out. Zoom fit. Okay. We also have a closest method. And so what the closest method does is uh, the ants, uh, the ancestors of an element, which could be the parent or the parent of the parents or the parent of the parent of the parents or however far up you go, uh, you can go ahead and uh, do a search through. So the ancestors together form a chain of parents that go all the way to the very top element. And so here from a particular element, you can, you can query the closest using a CSS selector. So, so and that will return the nearest ancestor that matches that CSS selector. Now, what's important to know is that the element itself is also included in that search. So if it has that CSS selection, uh, it matches, it'll return itself. And if it doesn't match itself, it'll check the parent. And if it doesn't match the parent, it'll check the parent's parent. And it propagates all the way to the top until it can't find a match. Or it finds the match. I made two slides of that, so these look the same. I will delete one of those. Okay, let me give an example. So, suppose I have 
this HTML code. So inside the body, I have a heading element. Inside my heading element is the contents. Then I have a div tag, which has a child of uh, an unordered list, which has two children of list items. And so let's look at some of these class names I have here. So inside my div tag has the class contents. Inside my unordered list has the class uh, attribute book. And inside my list items, I have class chapter and chapter. Okay, so inside my script, I'm going to do a query selector. And so remember, there was two forms of query selector. I, I could either select all or I could select one. So notice this is the one that's going to return a singular thing, not an HTML collection, but just an element object. So from my document object, I will query select and then pass the CSS selector of class name chapter. And I will return the first instance of chapter that appears and save that into my chapter variable. So that should grab the element that's defined on line seven. I will console log the result of on chapter. This is an element object. It has a closest method. So I will ask my element object to give me the closest element object that has the class name of book. So that should return that unordered list. And if I go and look inside my console, yes, indeed, I have access to that unordered list right there. Okay, okay. I can see that works pretty well. So let's go ahead and do some more uh, queries on our element object here. So I have still that element object chapter. I'll ask it to get the closest element object that has the class contents. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna search its parent. Its parent has that class name book. So it'll then search its parent, the class then propagates up, the search propagates up and it will give me this div because that matches that CSS selector. And in fact, that div with that class content is indeed returned. Finally, why don't we try something where we know it's bound to fail and see what happens as a result of that. So on, on chapter here, we will ask it to return the closest now, we don't have to just look for class names or ID names, right? Any CSS selector is appropriate. So we'll ask it for the next uh, element that is of a type H1, a heading one element. So from here, so this is the reference point we had, line seven. So we'll look at the parent. Nope, that's not a heading one. We'll look at the div. That's not a he heading one. The heading one does exist, right? But it's a sibling to div. So it's not a so it's not a child, right? Uh, so or it's not an ancestor to this list item, and so for that reason, this list item has no closest ancestor that matches this heading one, and so the result of this will be null. Okay, so there there are several other methods in addition to the query and they, in addition to, okay, so in addition to the query selectors and the get element by ID, there are, there are uh, get elements by tag name, get elements by class name and get elements by name. So name would be like the tag name, that'd be like a paragraph or a heading one. A class name would be able to pass in a, a class attribute name. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Ta this will be a tag attribute this would be the, uh, the, the, the type, the HTML type, the tag type, and this would be the, uh, the class name. But honestly, today, we would rather use query selectors. They're more powerful and they're shorter to write as opposed to these. So we'll, uh, I'm covering these for the sake of completeness. If you go across all code, what these will return is obviously HTML collections because they return uh, element node, element objects only. And then you could iter iterate across those to get the ones you want uh, or to process on all of them. But honestly, any one of these can be substituted with a query selector. So I would advocate you just get better at using query selectors as opposed to learning all these uh, additional types of methods to get elements by all these subcategories. Okay. And again, the big thing to remember, if you do end up using these or if you read these in other people's code, 
do know that they return HTML collections. They do not return HTML elements. So when you go and save those onto a, uh, when, when you go to access them, you can't just access an individual property. You would have to index to get access to the HTML, the element objects contained within the HTML collection to update the values. So uh, that's just that's just a big kind of common mistake that happens when dealing with some of these uh, Gitter methods that return HTML collections, where you might want to search for something and then set the value directly on the returned thing. But anything that is not either just a query selector or a get element by ID will be coalesced into a collection. And then you have to start indexing it to it. OK. Let's get back to normal size. So all my methods of get element by return a live collection, and this is true for get element by ID as well, or get element by name, or get element by class name, or get element by tag. Uh, and so anything that gets returned by a query selector all will be a static collection. So what is the difference between a live collection versus a static collection? Well, uh, the, the live collection, these collections reflect the current state of the document object and they actually auto update when changes occur. So your reference of things inside that collection will change. Uh, the query selector though will return a static collection, which will be a fixed array of elements. And so it will not change if there's mutations that occur in between your query and as you continue to process through that. And so for your own purposes, I left just a quick little summary on the different mechanisms we have to be able to search on these, um, to be able to search on uh, our DOM. Query selector, query selector all, get element by ID. These will probably be the, the three most popular ones you use. Uh, but you can also use get element by name, get element by tag name, and get element by class name. And these are just the criteria used to search. So these use the CSS selectors. This uses the ID. The, this uses either the tag, the name, the class. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so let's move on to the property. So let's talk more about these objects. So I, I mentioned that I wanted to delve a little bit deeper into the uh, class hierarchy on how the document object model was actually modeled inside the browser, because I think that'll give you meaningful insight on what you can do with each particular instance and how everything is kind of defined in terms of JavaScript objects. So again, this uses a very object-oriented approach. So what you're looking at is the inheritance tree here. So every specific concrete uh, HTML um, uh, element it has its own class name. It, it has a concrete class. So like an input type would be called an HTML input element. We already saw that the body is an HTML body element. We saw that, oh yeah, right here. We can see that the anchor tag would be an HTML anchor element. So these are all very specific concrete examples of an HTML element. These all inherit from something that is an HTML element. So, um, which, is, which is going to have all your common properties, all your common methods that is shared between all these, whereas these might have specific properties. Like for instance, an input has a property of type where not every HTML element has a type, whereas the HTML anchor element has a property of href unique kind of to itself. So HTML elements themselves inherit from the element class. And so these element class, the siblings to the element class would be text, el uh, not elements, text objects and comment objects. So all these are certain types of uh, particular types of nodes that can be defined inside of our tree. So all these can be or inherit from just the abstract node class. And then the node class itself inherits from this abstract class that is called an event target. An event target means that it's a something 
that can be registered with the event system inside the browser. So as you might have already uh, recalled or seen inside of the current lab, or you might already know based off the definition of what an event, uh, an event driven software system is, browsers are event driven systems, right? So the way that it works is there's a graphic user interface. It uh, listens for events to get triggered. When those events are triggered, it's put in an event queue. Um, actions that are designed to listen for those events and then handle those events via usually some kind of callback function uh, are then handled by the browser as it goes through the event loop, managing the queue and clearing out those events or causing whatever actions that it's listening for to trigger. And so in order for our HTML objects to be recipients or targets of the event queue of an event-driven system, they have to inherit from event target. That's essentially what that's saying. So the root of the hierarchy is the event target that is inherited by the node and all the other DOM nodes inherit from that. So does this make sense at least? Does this hierarchy make sense? So again, every HTML element is both an HTML, uh, every specific concrete example in our DOM, this is an actual HTML thing, is both an HTML element and it's a node and it's an element object, right? So as we use our different methods, we're just accessing them from different from, from different parts of our inheritance hierarchy. So because of this though, anything defined inside of uh, event targets will have those properties and behaviors and anything in node and element and HTML elements. So let's just look at some of the stuff that we're inheriting from. So you understand whenever you grab an element object, what that element object is capable of. So event target is just a abstract class. It means that the objects of that class are like never created, serves as a base of the DOM nodes. Uh, let's see, the node gives us this a parent node, next sibling, child nodes. Element gives us the get elements by tag name, the query selector, the next element sibling, the children, essentially all the methods we've been talking about inherit from different features of each of these classes. Okay. So let's talk about actual properties uh, that our nodes might have. So there's a type property. And so the type property is actually a numerical value. There's actually 12 different numerical types a node can have. The only ones we care about are one, three, and nine. One, one represents if it's an element node, three represents if it's a text node, nine represents if it's the document object itself. So again, you, you likely won't need to use this, but it's something good to know is that at, on any element you can access its node type property and it's going to be a numerical value that represents what type of node it is. Uh, there is a node name and tag name. These will return the same thing. So on, say for instance, we look at the uh, body element, we can just dereference the body right from the document object. So from the document object, I will dereference the body. And from the body are two properties, a node name and a tag name. If I go ahead and uh, just console log those out, I could see it will give me that those labels body and body there. So again, good properties if you need to match to check to see what your element type is essentially or uh, element name is. This is probably the one that we will care the most about. This will definitely be used inside of the labs and this will likely be how you're gonna mutate the state of your HTML content uh, in the most fundamental of ways. So uh, the node property inner HTML is a property in the element nodes that allow us to mutate uh, or modify uh, the element as a string. So again, this is a, so it allows us to get the HTML inside the element as a string, but it, it keep in mind this, this supports markup. So it's not just text, it's the actual markup text that's inside of there. That's the difference between inner text and inner HTML. And we can modify it. So if we do modify it, let me illustrate. Let me hop into here. Go into. OK, so let's take a look at this code. I have this body tag. I have a paragraph that just contains a text that says a paragraph. I have a div that contains the text a div. I have the script. 
on the script, I will do a console log on document.body.innerHTML. So I'm going to access the inner HTML of the body. And notice what I'm doing is I'm actually printing out the inner HTML content of that. And if I overwrite that, so I can assign into that, that is a property. It's like a variable and it is, uh, it's mutable. So if I overwrite that with some text or it could be HTML, I then actually change, this is a, a um, here's a preview pane of what happens after that. You can see that I no longer contain the paragraph and div, instead I'm illustrating the text, the new body. So again, at any point you can grab an element and you can, you can overwrite or you can append to it is enter HTML with new content. So we will definitely see that in this new lab. That is, will be the property we use the most to mutate the state of our DOM. Let's zoom back out of this. Okay, we also have outer HTML, which gives us access to the property itself, which if we do an overwrite with that, we actually delete what we were referencing. So this is, you don't want to use this. This is this one is a little bit more dangerous, and that's because to try to explain what's happening inside this example. Uh, let me go 100% here. Uh, okay, I have this body. I have a div. It has ID of alum, short for element. It contains the text "Hello World." I will do a quick console log of the outer HTML. Here I see it. It renders this "Hello World." I can see I grabbed the actual tag like. The, 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 the tag and everything inside of it, I grab. However, that's dangerous because it replaces, if I overwrite, if I change it, I actually replace that element in the DOM. I don't just mutate it. I don't, I don't just change it. I don't change it. I overwrite it. I, 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 so let's look at this. Let's, let's look at this concretely. If I have this body tag, inside the body tag, I have this div tag that contains hello world. Then I have this script. On this script, I'll do this quick query selector to grab the div element, right? And so now I have the div element as an element object inside of my JavaScript. And then I will, from that div element, I will then overwrite the outer HTML property with this new HTML property, a new element. And look, in my preview pane, I can see it's actually been overwritten, just like inner HTML. However, I'm going to console log the div dot outer HTML and notice, notice I still have the original div there. What happened here is the div becomes an obsolete reference now. It's no longer exists in the DOM, but it still exists in my JavaScript memory. Inside the DOM, it's, it, it's, I, I've overridden it with something that I don't have a reference to. So, so, so really, the difference between inner HTML and outer HTML is you want to think of inner HTML as something you're going to gain reference for inside your JavaScript runtime environment, but that you can mutate, but keep that reference over the course of your application. Outer HTML, the moment you, you overwrite that, uh, that HTML property, it's no longer a member of the DOM anymore. You've, you've replaced it with whatever you've overridden it, but now you have a reference to something that if you mutate, it doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't exist as part of the actual document object model anymore, although it does exist as a variable in JavaScript. So uh, yeah, use inner HTML, not outer HTML is really the takeaway here. Uh, we can also just access the text content. So if we don't want to necessarily access all of the uh, inner HTML, we can just get the text content. This is this is arguably a safer way to access text as opposed to inner HTML, although inner HTML typically works fine with that. Just be, just understand that if you ever overwrite into it, you'll overwrite any embedded HTML or any children, child HTMLs to that parent, that, that, that HTML element might be apparent too. So this just gives you a safer approach for accessing the text. Another property that is worth going into is the hidden property. And so the hidden property allows you to hide a element from the viewport when it gets rendered. So again, let me go ahead and just zoom into here. So an example of this is suppose that I have this body tag. Inside the body tag, I'll have this div that has this content. Both divs below are hidden. I will use the, the actual hidden attribute. So this is something supported uh, 
by HTML as an attribute for any element, in fact, where if you apply the hidden keyword, it will essentially set the display to none and it won't display that. Or what I could do is I can have this div give it an ID with some content and access from that element the hidden property and just set that equal to true. It's a Boolean value, true or false. And notice what it gets rendered in this pane is neither the one that has the HTML attribute defined or the uh, JavaScript property on the element object set to true. Neither of those will display. So if you need to dynamically select between element objects to display at any given time, you can set their state to hidden or to true or false and oscillate between things. Uh, so that you can run what's called a single page application. You can have all your different views defined in your JavaScript and determine which one is not hidden and have the rest of them hidden. And there's plenty more properties, but they usually are gonna be much more specific to the, uh, to the HTML uh, element object itself. So like for instance, you have the value property on inputs, which is really, uh, important. That's a usually, usually a big way that we import uh, data that we capture from the user via some kind of input element, and then we import the in uh, or we we access the input element from our DOM, check its value, and then use that value inside of our application. Other things could be like hrefs and anchor tags or source attributes and image tags. We we've seen that actually by creating image element objects inside of this platformer game and actually setting the source attribute to a image that we're maintaining. Uh, IDs are also a big one there as well. Excellent. Um, 3.15, oh, well, we, we made it mostly through, uh, through a lot of what we had to do for the document object. Uh, starting, so we'll finish off these slides covering the document object model next uh, next Tuesday, because it looks like it's 3.15 now. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll then also cover event-driven, the event-driven system of the browser. And so after we're done, I'm hoping uh, next lecture, uh, Tuesday's lecture, we will we'll be able to go ahead and um, uh, talk about asynchronous JavaScript. So with that said, is there any questions up to the document object so far? This is in terms of what's being modeled and how we can walk through it, how we can search it, how we can start to mutate the elements themselves. And these elements as they get mutated actually change their state in the viewport. Next, we'll actually see how we can make calls, not just to enter HTML, but in this next section, we'll see how we can actually modify the document by creating new nodes or HTML element objects and start appending them into our document that way. So we'll so we'll finish this lecture off here. But does this how how is the impression on the DOM? Does this does this seem grounded enough in terms of what's happening inside the browser to give us the capability to provide an interactive and dynamic web page? where the goal here is moving forward. Do you want to stop thinking as a web application, as a collection of HTML documents, and think of it as a single HTML document? Because the HTML document, uh, the, the content of an HTML document is mutable within the JavaScript runtime environment. So what's more valuable than having multiple HTML documents is having one consistent runtime environment where you can store all of your state, and you can mutate the view dynamically from the runtime environment and, 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 and build out essentially your own set of HTML content that you display to the viewport. So that's the real big motivating thing we're trying to build here. And understanding how the DOM works is really gonna help in understanding how we can uh, do, do uh, single page applications and how we're gonna use React effectively. Is there any questions? like? How how is everyone feeling about this? Okay, perfect.
So I will. So I'll finish. I'll finish this content off next week then. So I'm assuming. So if there's no questions um, for today, then I will uh, end the video now, and I'll say that I will. I will have the lab related to the document object model, and actually then handling up uh, this evening. I'm, I'm. I'm gonna do the final touch ups on the um on the intro section that talks about what the learning objectives are and then it'll be good to publish and then i'm also going to publish the um the actual homework documentation now, i've been teasing the homework for a while so i hope you have all started to consider it but you will be building a client-side application so a single page application so you will have to support multiple views you can either use the canvas api or the document api uh you, and um uh, and essentially, it will be it will be an application of your own design. So you will have to do something novel and interesting that runs just on client side. And probably the the first aspect. So I want everyone to to start considering what they want to start implementing. The first aspect will be to create a specification document, talking or announcing what it is you intend to build. Perfect. Let me stop this recording. <laughs>